Greetings, intrepid ABS 470 online students. This is Professor Jared Rathel, and I welcome you to lecture 1.1, the very first lecture in our course, The Life History of Mammals. So what I want you thinking about uh, today is what unites these seemingly disparate species from the animal here on the top left, which is an egg-laying species with no teeth, to this one here in the center, uh, an arboreal species that's going to carry its young in an abdominal pouch. The species on the top right, highly carnivorous species, lives in the Himalayan mountains some 15,000 feet above sea level. Here, uh, we have a species within which 1.5 million individuals are going to migrate over 300 miles chasing spring rains to get to greener calving grounds. Species here in the bottom middle, this is a pelagic open ocean species that we know transmits its hunting techniques from one generation to the next as a cultural heritage. And then finally, species on the bottom right, this one is 99% genetically identical to you and I. It's seen here uh, fishing with a rod that it crafted, fishing for termites. So my question to you today is what unites all of these organisms in the class Mammalia. So allow me to point out right from the start that while there are certainly diagnostic or distinguishing characteristics, common traits that are shared by all mammals, we define this lineage by its evolutionary ancestry, not necessarily by any particular characteristic. So when you think about mammals, probably one of the first characteristics that you think of is hair or fur. But consider the naked mole rat. So it's clearly a mammal, and yet it's almost completely hairless. So the hairlessness, or almost complete hairlessness, is secondarily derived. In ABS 470, we're going to define the class Mammalia following Rho 1988 as the most recent common ancestor right here of the monotremes, which are the duck-billed platypuses and the spiny echidnas, the most recent common ancestor of the monotremes and the theria, which includes the meta or the approximately 272 species of marsupials, as well as the true therians, or the eutheria, you means true, which is all of those placental mammals, as well as all of these extinct lineages. Okay? So, let's Think about what exactly is a mammal, and let's use uh, Linnaean taxonomy to kind of help us hone in, okay? So we're going to go from the most inclusive taxonomic category, okay, from domain all the way down to the most inclusive category, in this case, class, okay, the class mammalia. So we know that mammals consist of eukaryotic cells. That is to say, large, at least larger than bacterial cells, which are only one to 10 microns, large complex cells that are made from membrane-bound organelles, like uh, a nucleus that has a nuclear envelope, a, a nuclear membrane around it. So this includes the eukaryotes are the protists, the plants, the fungi, as well as the animals. So the kingdom Animalia represents mobile, multicellular, and 
heterotrophic species, eliminating the mostly single-celled protists, although not also, and the relatively immobile fungi, as well as the photosynthetic plants. Mammals are members of the phylum chordata, which means they have multiple synapomorphies, including the development of a flexible rod structure deemed the notochord, which develops into the vertebrae and vertebrata. They also have a dorsal hollow nerve cord, which will develop into your central nervous system. They have a post-anal tail, ours is highly truncated, and lastly, the chordata have pharyngeal gill slits or pouches or arches, which will become the jaw and the inner ear in mammals. So this is going to eliminate the vast majority of animals, including the most diverse, biologically uh, diverse uh, lineage on the planet, the beetles. Remember, 60% of animals are beetles. The subphylum vertebrata, or the craniates, is going to exclude the tunicates, but it's going to include the jawless fishes, the cartilaginous fishes, the sharks and rays, the bony fishes, the amphibians, reptiles, and the star of our show, the mammals. So all of these animals develop a cranium and vertebrae, with the exception of the hagfish, which has a rudimentary vertebral column. Mammals are tetrapods, tetra meaning four, and pod is foot in Greek. So that, of course, is going to eliminate both our cartilaginous and bony fish. The tetrapods, that is to say, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, represent the descendants of something akin to the lobe-finned fish-like, salamander-like fossil named Titolic. This is a 375 million year old transitional species. The amniotes represent vertebrates that lay eggs that are impermeable to water and have three extra embryonic membranes, the amnion, the chorion, and the allantois. So this is going to eliminate our amphibians which have to lay their eggs in water, thus they're tied to living in or near water or in really wet environments like the tropical rainforest. So our uh, tree frog is uh, now out. So I know you're probably saying to yourself, um, you know, wait a minute, with the exception of the platypus and the echidnas, mammals do not lay eggs. And you are correct, uh, but the amniotic egg has been highly modified in mammals. So, for example, in the placental mammals, the embryo is surrounded by the amnion, which is filled with the amniotic fluid. So doctors will often uh, ch check out this fluid uh, in developing uh, fetuses just to check on the health of the unborn child. Meanwhile, the allantois and the yolk sac become the umbilical cord, which of course is the connection uh, between mother and fetus. Uh, it's going to provide a glucose and oxygen and then remove nitrogenous waste and CO2. So together with the chorion, um, these membranes are going to make up the placenta which physically attaches the embryo to the uterine wall of mom. 
And around the hole is the fluid-filled Corian, which when it breaks, uh, the water has broken and labor begins. So fear not, we're going to return to this uh, in our lecture on the evolution of mammals. But in short, mammals are what we call synapsids, which means they only have a single temporal fossa on each side of their skull. Whereas reptiles are diapsid, di meaning two. So we're going to have two of these temporal fossa or openings on the skull. So the diapsids are now eliminated. The Komodo dragon is out. But other synapsids are included, uh, like this guy down here. This is Dimetrodon. And again, we're going to, to come back to him. And finally, this brings us to this adorable red panda here on the bottom right. So uh, mammals are distinguished from their synapsid relatives uh, by their large and heavy dentary bone right down here, the lower jaw. Okay, you can see that it's all one bone. Uh, the dentary bone in mammals is going to form a joint with the squamosal bone. And again, we're coming back uh, to these concepts. So apart from Linnaean taxonomy, what other key adaptations help us distinguish mammals from other taxa? Mammals are endo thermic as opposed to ectothermic, meaning they're going to maintain a higher body temperature than that of the external environment. Recall that ectotherms are going to have highly variable body temperature that's going to fluctuate as the external environment fluctuates. Many mammals are not only endothermic, they're homeothermic, meaning they're going to maintain a relatively constant body temperature even as environmental temperatures fluctuate. So consider us, humans living in the Sonoran Desert, right? It could be 115 degrees or below freezing, and we're aiming to keep at about 98.6. So we're going to return to thermoregulation during our fifth unit in the fifth week. Endothermy has allowed mammals to exploit an incredible array of habitats from the open ocean to high in the Himalayas, but endothermy comes at a massive energetic cost, resulting in higher metabolic rates. And so therefore mammals, they're going to need to eat frequently. So in my, in my lab, as I may have mentioned, I house a lot of different reptiles and the star of our show is a six foot Sonoran gopher snake. So this massive snake, Delilah, she only eats twice a month, uh, whereas this baleen whale is constantly on the hunt. So I love this, a concise but very accurate way to describe mammals is veritable eating machines, <laughs> at least relative to other vertebrates. Many of the traits that we associate with mammals ultimately serve this purpose of being eating machines. Together, they form this correlated suite of adaptations. Adaptations like complex teeth or heterodont dentition, whole array of foraging strategies, locomotor specializations, and relative to fish and reptiles, mammals have very large brains. These large brains, in fact, all of these attributes, the complex teeth, the 
uh, foraging strategies, they're all about meeting, feeding those voracious appetites of these high energy animals. So initially, the brains likely enlarge to support olfaction, um, the sense of smell. Uh, the mammalian sense of smell is very keen, and it's key in helping many mammals identify their foods. Likewise, hair or fur, uh, it was present in the more recent synapsid ancestors, and it's also probably pretty obviously correlated with endothermy. So hair and fur is going to provide insulation to trap and conserve body heat, that body heat that was so expensive to generate. So not only do mammals require large amounts of energy to maintain themselves, but they also invest heavily, energetically invest in their offspring. So we're gonna cover mammalian reproduction in, well, next week, and then we'll cover uh, mating systems and parental investment in week four. But for now, what I need you to recognize is are these terms here. So oviparity refers to species where the females lay eggs with little or no other embryonic development within the mother like the monotremes, the platypus and the echidnas. Although the production of those eggs is very energetically expensive. So they're still, you know, relative to uh, other taxa investing heavily in their offspring. Viviparity has evolved in the marsupials, which have altricial or undeveloped, relatively undeveloped young, and as well as the placentals, which are going to have precocial or well-developed young. In both of these cases, the females give birth to live young, like these very real photos of a giraffe birth. And then female mammals are going to produce this wondrous, highly nutritious, high caloric, high fat food, this liquid known as milk, in their mammary glands. Mammary, mammal, so it's the namesake of mammals. We'll return to the placenta uh, next week when we talk about reproduction, but in placental mammals, the suckling period at the mammary glands is preceded by this period, uh, it's a long period, uh, in which the fetus develops in utero. And this period is known as gestation. So while humans have an approximately nine month gestation time, the uh, gestation period for an African elephant, which has a considerably larger body size, is 22 months. That's gonna conclude chapter one, part one, called Mammals in Your Text. So next I want you to skip ahead to chapter four, part seven, and I want you to read that short blurb entitled Characteristics of Mammals. It's just two pages. So I'm gonna really quickly summarize that. So endothermic mammals with high metabolic rates are veritable eating machines as we've already established. If they're eating machines, we know they're doing lots of cellular respiration. They're breaking down that glucose to get ATP. They're doing cellular respiration. So they need oxygen. Thus, mammals have evolved a very efficient pump uh, to move blood. So mammals have a four-chambered heart. If I get my cursor to come up here. Uh, mammals have two atria on the top, which receive the blood, and then two ventricles on the bottom, which are going to pump the blood. The ventricles are separated by a wall. That wall is called the septum. And this is what makes that heart so, so efficient because it's going to separate the deoxygenated blue blood from the oxygenated red blood. Okay? If we look at other vertebrates with lower metabolic rates, fish 
only have two chambers, one atrium and one ventricle. Uh, most amphibians and reptiles are going to have three chambers, two atria and one ventricle. And then uh, some of the more derived reptiles, the crocodilians, uh, as well as birds, which of course evolved from theropods. Uh, birds, uh, crocodilians and mammals have the four-chambered heart. If we think about birds, they too have a very high metabolic rate, so they need um, lots of oxygen moving to those cells. If we zoom in on the mammalian blood cells, we find that the red blood cells have lost their nucleus and further their biconcave, meaning on both sides they have this con uh, concave shape, which is going to allow them the ability to carry bukus of oxygen. What do I mean by that? Each red blood cell has approximately 270 million hemoglobin molecules, and each of those hemoglobin molecules can bind four molecules of oxygen. So we've already discussed the production of milk by the mammary glands, or mammae, the plural, uh, that's uh, beautifully shown here uh, by this uh, female basset hound. And then finally, uh, mammals have this flat parachute shaped muscle called the diaphragm, which is going to contract and allow the volume of the lungs to increase, creating a negative pressure and air flowing in. And then when it relaxes, it's going to decrease that volume, <sighs> forcing air out. So again, this is high respiration, high metabolic rate, uh, because we're all about feeding the machine, right? The eating machine. So in conclusion, when we talk about mammals, what do we mean? Mammals are smart, big brains, mobile, eating machines that exhibit great maternal care. Lots of energy invested in our young, uh, like this female orangutan and her babe. So I look forward to joining you for lecture 1.2 uh, when we discuss why should we even study mammals. Uh, so we'll get into the importance of mammalogy and the importance of mammals uh, to ecosystems and to our lives. I appreciate uh, your time and attention, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.